episode 46. It will be attended to, said Dumbledore, also bowing. Come, said Madame Maxine imperiously to her students, and the Hogwarts crowd parted to allow her and her students to pass up the stone steps. Happy Derek and Armstrong's horses are going to be, Seamus Finnegan said, leaning around Lavender and Parvati to address Harry and Ron. Well, if they're any bigger than this lot, even Hagrid won't be able to handle them, said Harry. That is, if he hasn't been attacked by his scroots. Wonder what's up with them. Maybe they've escaped, said Ron, hopefully. Oh, don't say that, said Hermione with a shudder. Imagine that lot loose in the grounds. They stood, shivering slightly now, waiting for the Durmstrang party to arrive. Most people were gazing hopefully up at the sky. For a few minutes, the silence was broken only by Madame Maxine's huge horses snorting and stamping. But then, can you hear something? said Ron suddenly. Harry listened. A loud and oddly eerie noise was drifting toward them from out of the darkness. A muffled rumbling and sucking sound, as though an immense vacuum cleaner was moving along a riverbed. The lake, yelled Lee Jordan, pointing down at it. Look at the lake! From their position at the top of the lawns overlooking the grounds, they had a clear view of the smooth black surface of the water. Except that the surface was suddenly not smooth at all. Some disturbance was taking place deep in the center. Great Bubbles were forming on the surface. Waves were now washing over the muddy banks. And then, out in the very middle of the lake, a whirlpool appeared, as if a giant plug had just been pulled out of the lake's floor. What seemed to be a long black pole began to rise slowly out of the heart of the whirlpool. And then Harry saw the rigging. It's a mast, he said to Ron and Hermione. Slowly, magnificently, the ship rose out of the water, gleaming in the moonlight. It had a strangely skeletal look about it, as though it was a resurrected wreck, and the dim, misty lights shimmering at its portholes looked like ghostly eyes. Finally, with a great sloshing noise, the ship emerged entirely, bobbing on the turbulent water, and began to glide toward the bank. A few moments later, they heard the splash of an anchor being thrown down in the shallows and the thud of a plank being lowered onto the bank. People were disembarking. They could see their silhouettes passing the lights in the ship's portholes. All of them, Harry noticed, seemed to be built along the lines of Crab and Goyle. But then as they drew nearer, walking up the lawns into the light streaming from the entrance hall, he saw that their bulk was really due to the fact that they were wearing cloaks of some kind of shaggy, matted fur. But the man who was leading them up to the castle was wearing furs of a different sort, sleek and silver, like his hair. Dumbledore, he called out heartily as he walked up the slope. How are you, my dear fellow? How are you? Blooming. Thank you, Professor Karkaroff, Dumbledore replied. Karkaroff had a fruity, unctuous voice. When he stepped into the light pouring from the front doors of the castle, they saw that he was tall and thin like Dumbledore. But his white hair was short, and his goatee, finishing in a small curl, did not entirely hide his rather weak chin. When he reached Dumbledore, he shook hands with both of his own. Dear old Hogwarts, he said, looking up at the castle and smiling. His teeth were rather yellow, and Harry noticed that his smile did not extend to his eyes, which remained cold and shrewd. How good it is to be here. How good. Victor, come along into the warmth. You don't mind, Dumbledore. Victor has a slight head cold. Karkaroff beckoned forwards one of his students. 
As the boy passed, Harry caught a glimpse of a prominent curved nose and thick black eyebrows. He didn't need the punch on the arm Ron gave him or the hiss in his ear to recognize that profile. Harry is crumb! Chapter 16 The Goblet of Fire I don't believe it! Ron said in a stunned voice as the Hogwarts students filed back up the steps behind the party from Durmstrang. Crumb, Harry! Victor Crumb! Oh, for heaven's sakes, Ron, he's only a Quidditch player, said Hermione. Only a Quidditch player, Ron said, looking at her as though he couldn't believe his ears. Hermione, he's one of the best seekers in the world! I had no idea he was still at school. As they recrossed the entrance hall with the rest of the Hogwarts students, heading for the Great Hall, Harry saw Lee Jordan jumping up and down on the soles of his feet to get a better look at the back of Crumb's head. Several sixth-year girls were frantically searching their pockets as they walked. Oh, I don't believe it. I haven't got a single quill on me. Do you think he'd sign my hat and lipstick? Really? said Hermione loftily as they passed the girls, now squabbling over the lipstick. I'm getting his autograph if I can, said Ron. You haven't got a quill, have you, Harry? No, they're upstairs in my bag, said Harry. They walked over to the Gryffindor table and sat down. Ron took care to sit on the side facing the doorway because Crumb and his fellow Durmstrang students were still gathered around it, apparently unsure about where they should sit. The students from Beaubetons had chosen seats at the Ravenclaw table. They were looking around the great hall with glum expressions on their faces. Three of them were still clutching scarves and shawls around their heads. It's not that cold, said Hermione irritably, who was watching them. Why didn't they bring cloaks? Over here! Come and sit over here, Ron hissed. Over here, Hermione, budge up, make a space. What? Too late, said Ron bitterly. Victor Crumb and his fellow Durmstrang students had settled themselves at the Slytherin table. Harry could see Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle looking very smug about this. As he watched, Malfoy bent forwards to speak to Crumb. Yeah, that's right. Smarm up to him, Malfoy, said Ron scathingly. I bet Crumb can see right through him, though. Bet he gets people fawning over him all the time. Where do you reckon they're going to sleep? We could offer him a space in our dormitory, Harry. I wouldn't mind giving him my bed. I, I could keep him my camp bed. Hermione snorted. They look a lot happier than the Bobbitons lot, said Harry. The Durmstrang students were pulling off their heavy furs and looking up at the starry black ceiling with expressions of interest. A couple of them were picking up the golden plates and goblets and examining them, apparently impressed. Up at the staff table, Filch, the caretaker, was adding chairs. He was wearing his moldy old tailcoat in honor of the occasion. Harry was surprised to see that he added four chairs, two on either side of Dumbledore's. But there are only two extra people, Harry said. Why is Filch putting out four chairs? Who else is coming? Eh? said Ron vaguely. He was still staring avidly at Crumb. When all the students had entered the hall and settled down at their house tables, the staff entered, filing up to the top table and taking their seats. Last in line were Professor Dumbledore, Professor Karkaroff, and Madame Maxine. When their headmistress appeared, the pupils from Bobetons leapt to their feet. A few of the Hogwarts students laughed. The Bobetons party appeared quite unembarrassed and did not resume their seats until Madame Maxine had sat down on Dumbledore's left-hand side. Dumbledore, however, remained standing, and a silence fell over the great hall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, ghosts, and most particularly guests, said Dumbledore, beaming around at the foreign students.